again. Where'd I, that come from? I had just learned how to ride the bike, mm-hmm. and I'm going. <laughs> I got to do something with it. I can't make it just this pointless thing. I learned, how, okay, I did it, and now I'm never going to do it again. I was like, you know what might be fun is just, like, riding my bike across the country at some point in my life. And this is when I have – I'm not even – I'm still in the hospital. I just learned how to ride the bike. I should do something like ride, ride my bike across the country or something like that. <laughs> you know, something, something cool like that. And – I was rowing. I didn't do it right because I, I, had, I had made the commitment to do the rowing. Right. So I was like, I'm going to do rowing, but eventually I will do this cross-country bike ride. And so I did another year of rowing after that. I, I took the time to kind of plan it out how I wanted to do it. And so I took another year of rowing and then finished world championships that year in fourth. Um, and about a month later, drove up to Maine, started riding. <laughs> This is in October, and, and so what was the what was that all? Uh, what was the what did that day to day look like? Uh, so I had a box truck, a U-Haul box truck. I bought like a used two hundred thousand miles U-Haul box truck. Check. My, <laughs> I, put, I laid down some carpets in the back. Check. Um, had a couple cots, a couple sleeping bags, supplies. Check. <laughs> and my little brother, who was about to turn 18. Check. Uh, rogered up to drive. Good to go. That's all you need right there. <laughs> Box truck. Water. Two cots, carpet, and a little brother. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I didn't really train much. for What I did was I made sure that my prosthetics fit correctly and I was able to ride the bike. That's all I really did. I didn't you know, go out and ride a hundred miles or anything, any kind of formal training for it. Yeah. Cause I figured be... what is the point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just start. And the <laughs> beginning is the training for the finish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sure. the day to day would be wake up probably six, seven o'clock, you know, drive out to wherever I was starting for the day. Cause mm-hmm. you couldn't, you can't just like stop and then yeah. pull over. So we'd have to like drive the truck somewhere park it in a church parking lot or mm-hmm. a fire department parking lot and then uh start yeah so riding. you don't get apprehended by the cops <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. yeah. Well, so the first time so i had i was right ri- i'd be riding my bike and then my brother would be kind of half on half off the road right. and I, I picked a route that we didn't have you know not super busy roads so i wouldn't get in too many people's way until i got the pacific coast highway and then people were super pissed <laughs> and uh at one point, this cop, the fir- the first cop I encountered, pulls over in front of us. I'm like, all right, here we go. He's mm-hmm. going to tell me to stop. He rides over. And then he gets out, and he's like, I just want to shake your hand, man. <laughs> it's like, phew, okay. <laughs> nice. This is how it's going to go. This awesome. Is, so I'm going to get – the cops love me. Um, and so I wake up, start riding probably around 7.38. I might eat breakfast beforehand. Um, probably ride – I would do 30 miles a day, so I'd just break that up however mm-hmm. I felt for the day. Right. Take breaks, hop in the back of the truck, sit around for a while. And I'd run. I'd ride 30 miles, and then wherever I finished, 30 miles, I might go a little bit further for a better pulling-off point, stop, get in the truck, drive off to wherever we might be able to park the truck, and then spend the night in the truck, and then uh, drive back out to that spot the next day, do it again. <laughs> Luckily for me, a lot of hotels started to offer us nights to sleep. So we were really only sleep in the truck for the first month. And then after that, we were mostly in hotels. And this was like a six-month journey, right? Six months, October to, October to April. Oh, so you did it through the wintertime. Yeah. You ever heard of the polar vortex? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> no, no, what is that? It was polar vortex it was, here. it was like this freezing... Uh, temperatures that came down and and like attacked the nation with cold <laughs> they called it the polar vortex yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it sounded very threatening it's, it's one yeah. step high, <laughs> it does, it's yeah. one step higher than a sharknado <laughs> <laughs> Dig it. uh five thousand one hundred eighty miles yep. in the winter time every day for 180 days um you talk about fortitude in your journal and i'm gonna read it it was through it was through the true purpose of the Marine Corps that I became what I am today. And it is that it is that 
And that is the act of fighting the battles of the United States. It is through the preparation for and the fighting of America's wars that Marines gain their fine edge and an idea of the true meaning of courage, spirit, tenacity, altruism, and brotherhood. After having been imbued with the essential qualities ascribed to Marines in boot camp, it is up to the individual Marine and his leadership, all the way from the fire team leader to the commandant, to make him the ideal tool for the Corps. And there's no better place than a war to do this. It was during my two deployments that I learned what it means to be courageous. Almost on a daily basis, my fellow Marines and I would be subjected to situations with high potential for danger and situations with infinite, unknowable, possible outcomes. The dangerous and unpredictable nature of these conditions elicits fear, nervousness, and uncertainty in all people. However, without fail, when the time came to strap on our gear and proceed forth into these conditions, we did it with no hesitation because it was what we needed to do. To me, that is courage. I learned it from the example set by my leaders and my compatriots, and when it was my turn, I endeavored to teach others by my own example. My favorite among the many mantras of the Marine Corps is adapt and overcome. It is my favorite because it embodies the spirit and tenacity that Marines must possess in order to be the world's greatest warfighting force. To Marines, accomplishment of their mission is of the utmost importance, above that of their own lives, and the ability to adapt and overcome is key. The idea is straightforward. Change whatever you need to in order to become what is required to transcend an obstacle. If there is no bridge over a river, a Marine will swim. If there is a wall in front of us, we will blow it apart. If there is an enemy on a hill that we want, we will remove him. Marines do not stop until they have accomplished their mission regardless of any monkey wrench that gets thrown into their plan. They will change their plan plan a thousand times if it need be until what needs to be done is done. And then they will move on to the next mission. It was these two qualities that kept me, that allowed me to keep fighting after I was wounded. My plan of accomplishing something with my life and making my life as good as possible was met with obstacles and monkey wrenches. But since I had already learned these lessons, bypassing these obstacles and moving on was easy and natural. The brotherhood that the Marines share is the defining feature that initially attracted me to the Marine Corps. And over the course of two deployments, I experienced it to its fullness. The reason that I was able to be courageous and adapt and overcome was because of the men that stood beside me doing the same thing. And it is because we were experiencing war and hardship together that we grew grew close enough that I cared for them more than I cared for myself and would sacrifice my safety for their well-being even if it meant being extinguished. And although it never needed to be said, I knew this was reciprocated. To me, this is the definition of brotherhood and selflessness and from my having been part of such a relationship is why I am loyal and put others before myself as if it were a default setting. Without the Marine Corps, I have no idea where I would be or what I would be like. All I can say for sure is that I am what I am now, due in large part to what I was taught and what I experienced during my five years in the Marine Corps. Awesome. 
If there's anything that the Marine Corps teaches you, it is brotherhood. It is endurance. How to endure situations you don't want to have to be in. <laughs> uh, whether it's humping around with a pack or fighting in Afghanistan, Iraq, or if it's sitting in the back of a seven-ton getting drenched in rain and then having to set up a tent, blah, blah, blah. It teaches you those things. And so I already knew all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I was good at it by the time I became an amputee. And then I got even better at it once I was an amputee, even more experience. And then so that led into being able to endure whatever I had to for the bike ride. And I think the slogan slogan for the Wounded Warrior Regiment in the Marine Corps is, I don't know if this is, it's Latin, I don't know if it's, I'm pronouncing it right, it's etium in pugna, which is still in the fight. And, you know, I'm not still in the main fight that's going on in Iraq or Afghanistan. I've been taken out of that fight. But the overall fight, I'm still in that. I'm still a representative of America. I'm still a representative of Marines. I'm dedicating myself to help my brothers that are struggling or come back wounded. I'm still in that portion of the fight. And, I mean, just remember, you just have to remember that, that slogan to stay Stay in the fight. Just keep fighting. Or well, obviously you're staying in the fight. And I, I you know, I, you, again, reading through your journal stuff um, is awesome. And there's a bunch of different things that I wanted to pull out. And obviously I can't read the whole damn thing. Right. Maybe I could, but I'll <laughs> leave that for you. Uh, but one of the things, you know, I'm always thinking that what, you know, what can I pull out that I think will be really helpful to other people? And I thought that this thing that you wrote right here was just something that can be used by, by anybody, especially people that are facing tough situations, which, as you just mentioned, you are pretty dang good at dealing <laughs> with tough situations. And I think this gives a little insight into that. So here we go. Back to your journal. The Kubler-Ross model explains the stages by which an individual grieves for a lost intimate. The five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. In this case, it could be said, I was grieving for myself. The former me that had died in Sangin. Since I had a natural understanding of conservation of energy and an awareness of the time required to reach my goal, I instinctively skipped the first four steps and proceeded to the acceptance portion of the process. I had decided that to spend my limited energy resources on denial, anger, bargaining, and depression would be a pointless waste and would be better left off of my itinerary. I wanted to be able to expend as much energy as I could toward my goal, which would not only allow me to reach it faster, but would improve the quality of my success. The sooner I had accepted my situation, the sooner I could get to where I wanted to be. Having one's legs amputated above the knee is categorically a negative experience. If I hadn't had the right mindset afterward, the rest, rest of my life could have also become a negative experience. Fortunately, I was able to react to the loss by accepting the negative energy from that occurrence and using it to open doors for myself in order to be sure that my life would remain a positive experience. No matter who you are, whether you are healthy or ill, injured or able-bodied, everyone's main purpose in life is to make it as good as possible. This is an unchanging objective for all people, no matter what happens. Thus, now that I was a double above the knee amputee, I needed to figure out a way to keep my life enjoyable. 
With this in mind, I researched the Paralympics to see if I could participate, which led to a bronze medal at the 2012 Games. Not only that, I accepted people into my life who have enriched it beyond what I could have imagined. From the experiences associated with sports, I have learned lessons that have and will continue to make me a better person. Lessons that I can pass on to others in the future. It was in this way that I was able to transform the negative experience of having lost the lower part of my legs into the positive experience and energy of participating in a sport and all that has accompanied it. If you are ill or injured, use it as a way to discover a new hobby or career. If someone is rude to you and makes you angry, use the anger to fuel a workout. If someone you know has a terminal illness, use it as an opportunity to make a difference in their life and in the world. The most important part of transforming energy from negative to positive is being aware of opportunities as they are presented and having the courage to seize them. Energy is all around us, constantly fueling and transforming. It will affect us in ways we cannot be we cannot predict be a person that uses energy intelligently instead of wasting it I like to say use the weight and I kind of analogize it I like to lift weights I'm sure you guys can probably tell huh? I like to analogize it with maybe like a strict press so the weight on the bar is whatever. Girlfriend broke up with you, whatever possible issue you're having. And you can hold that bar on your shoulders and you can just leave it there and eventually start to hurt. And then eventually, if you leave it there long enough, you'll just be on the ground with that weight on your chest. You can't move anymore. Or when you have that weight on the bar and it's on your shoulders, you shoulder press it and then you do it again and you do it again and again and then you let your body adapt and next time you try and lift that weight it's nothing you can do that weight easily I can handle that no problem and then you can handle even more weight and then when you get good at that you seek out the weight you purposefully try and make things harder for yourself so that you can just become even stronger and even stronger. And you embrace that and you start to enjoy it a little bit. And so, I mean, that, I think that's what I was trying to say there. I think you said it. Not only did you <laughs> say it, but uh, you actually are living that currently at this time, seeking out more, uh, I guess maybe I, w- I would even go so far as to say stupid things to do because 